Good evening, my name is Maggie Goodwin and I am the pastor of Whittier Presbyterian and Salem Lutheran Churches and I wanted to personally apologize for the live stream being down today. We're still figuring out exactly what happened that made it so that we couldn't stream the, uh, the service live. However, we made sure to hit the record button. It um, didn't quite start recording um, right as we started the intro, which is good because that means I can record a new intro specifically for those of you watching online and welcome you to um, the space that we created this afternoon to honor and celebrate the life of Melinda Sullivan. And so I am going to um, give at least an adapted version of that introduction that I gave earlier today to say good evening and on behalf of Rich and Melinda and Rich's family, and all of the extended Sullivan family. Thank you for being here today to celebrate Melinda's life. Melinda lived an eventful and faithful and fruitful life. And we celebrate that this afternoon. We also celebrate a gracious and loving God who, was, who has welcomed Melinda into her heavenly home. When someone lives, life, lives a life like Melinda's, there is a sense of fulfillment when we gather to celebrate their life. It wasn't long enough, but it was packed so full of love. So of course, this celebration is mixed with sadness too, as we say goodbye together and tell stories and share memories of Melinda's life and remember and feel the impact she had on our lives. But in the midst of that sadness, we can rejoice in a life well lived. This is also a time for us to worship and praise God who gave Melinda to us and in whose presence now she rejoices as she receives that divine accolade. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest and the joy that I have prepared for you. So I invite you to receive the comfort of our loving God in the midst of our sadness and the joy of the Lord too, as we remember the delightful events and aspects of Melinda's life. And just as a, as a heads up, the second hymn, um, I believe you will hear me introduce it, and then it will kind of blip and cut to um, remembrances. And the reason for that is that we had a special slide put in, um, just so that you could see a particular photo of Melinda that you've already seen at the introduction of the service. And we did something funny with the audio settings for that. And so you can't actually hear the hymn anyway. And so rather than a handful of moments of silence, um, I just kind of cut that shorter than it, it would be. <laughs> so with that, um, let's get back into the service. So please pray with me. Loving God, you stand at the beginning of our lives as our creator. You stand at the end of our lives as our gracious redeemer and merciful judge. And you walk with us during our lives as our friend and teacher, our comforter and the one in whom we can, all place, we can place all our hope. As we celebrate Melinda's life this afternoon, may the story of her life point us toward yours and in so, and in so doing, Draw us closer to knowing you and loving you, even as you love us. We pray in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Now, our first hymn uh, this afternoon is Here I Am, Lord. It is number 525 in the hymnals. And you should know, as particularly as we have gone through um, this time of pandemic, we started out recording a lot of the hymns, particularly so that we could have the soloist record on top of them. And so I believe this hymn was, was recorded before Melinda passed and she likely worshiped along to it as we will this morning or this afternoon. Um, and the one thing you will notice is that in the line, here I am, Lord, is it I, Lord, as you follow along in the hymnal. Oh, and it's the blue hymnal. Forgot, we have several hymnals. All the hymns today will be out of the blue hymnal. Um, that the words say, here I am, Lord, is it I, Lord? The soloist says, it is I, Lord, but we'll get through it. <laughs>
Well, I hope everybody can hear me. I want to thank you for coming. Uh, before I get started, I want to thank uh, three people in particular. Uh, Martin Angiovine and Andy Morales and Mike Morales. They, uh, when Melinda was sick, they built a ramp at our house so she could go home from the hospital. And I never got to thank them. They did it on their own. Also, all the cards and letters we got, I didn't get a chance to respond to them. Melinda would want me to do that. Now I want to make sure everybody understands we received those. They helped her feel better. And uh, most of you may not know this, but online, Mike Morales was able to get Oral Hirschheiser to uh, give her a video message in which case he talked to her about cancer because this is, when, this is before we had the final diagnosis. We knew it was cancer, but we didn't know how bad it was. And Melinda truly loved that. Uh, he even mentioned in the, uh, it was personalized to her, he even mentioned that he used to play for the Giants because he knew we were a mixed household. <laughs> so uh, uh, he didn't have anything nice to say about the Giants, but that was usual. Anyway, I want to make sure and do that. And the people who also helped in the meal train, there was food that was provided for us. That was a big help. Uh, this kind of caught us by surprise. We were kind of staying in place because of the pandemic, and we hadn't been out much. He hadn't been out hardly at all. I was the only one going out pretty much. And. Uh, one more thing before I get started. She loved this church. Uh, as I was telling someone as they came in the door, when we lived on Monte Vista, we lived about three blocks from the Presbyterian Church. Eventually, it had to be sold and they merged and, and, and meet with the Lutheran Church here, which I think is amazing. But she really loved this church. She was involved in it for 40 years. That's how old my kids are. So she was involved in all that time. She became an elder. She, if you knew Melinda, you knew she was a participant. She could not not participate. That was how we're different. But, and if you knew us, that's the way it was. And before I tell you about my best friend, I want to thank you all for coming. In the middle of a pandemic, I realize we have to do all of these things. I appreciate the church going, helping us do it. Uh, and those who are watching on video, Melinda, when she was kind of housebound during the pandemic, hooked up with some of our high school alums, fellow high, they were mine too, but I didn't really know them very well. <laughs> and she, every Monday at four o'clock, she'd get on Zoom and she'd talk to people, some of whom she knew since grade school. And it was, just amazing how much she enjoyed that. And if you knew Melinda, you knew she liked to talk, she liked to participate. And so it's kind of interesting combination, the two of us. But before preparing these remarks, I had an opportunity to go through some boxes and materials that we had had for 50 years, moved from one location to another location, moved it but never opened. And 
until I opened it and found out all the stuff she had saved from high school. It was just amazing. I mean, this was a, a person who really participated. I mean, she was girls league president. She was this, she was that. And she, she was, a lot of it didn't get recognition, but she was very active her whole life in that area. And uh, I found letters, as many of you know, our courtship was largely by mail because Uncle Sam decided I had to go to Korea. And also I was out of state when I started pursuing her. So there are, it's hard to remember, but people used to write letters. I have a cedar chest full of letters because we saved them all. Uh, they're from Korea, they're from D.C., they're from Wisconsin, everywhere. And Melinda and I used to joke about the fact that we didn't know what to do with them. We never read them again. I've read them since she passed. Not all of them, there's too many. I haven't read them all. But she, we used to joke about, well, we can't let the kids see these, because first of all, they're probably X-rated. <laughs> and I can honestly tell you, having read a good percentage of them, it was the 70s and they're PG. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, I read it and I go, that, I mean, parents did have romances. You know? And so, anyway, maybe one day they'll feel uh, capable of, of reading these letters. Uh, they speak of our love for each other. Now, let me tell you about my, oh, one other thing I learned is that uh, when she was a kid, Excuse my runny nose, it has nothing to do with anything other than the fact I'm a little emotional. Uh, she was known as Lindy. I never knew her as Lindy, but I found documents talking about Lindy. And actually, I think her dad called her Mo. And so occasionally I'd see things with Mo written on it. I always called her Melinda, sweetheart, honey, kid. I am 16 days older than she is, so <laughs> it's always kid. And later on, after she became a grandparent, it was Mimi or Nana. And I found myself calling her that all of a sudden. And I never, it just blended in with the, with the additional children. Anyway, Melinda was very something special, and it's obvious because you are here. There are people here who went to high school with her. There are people here who went to college with her. There are people here who worked with her in PTA and a lot of volunteer organizations besides family. And she, she got around. She may have been born and died in Whittier, but she got around. And, and fortunately, after I retired, she got even more around because we were able to travel a lot. But uh, when people hear that Will and I knew each other since we were 15, they tend to think, oh, high school sweethearts. Long way from that. She was, in the term of the day, a social. <laughs> she, she was a member of this and that and everything, and I was a member of nothing. When I graduated in my annual, I had to figure out what to put underneath my name. I think I put math major. Like that really had an influence on my life. But <laughs> she had a list of organizations. She, I, she used to tell people how she remembers me meeting me. And that was, and the people that are online, especially the ones that know her from high school, she used to talk about, well, I, met him, I remember him from high school when he fell asleep in a psychology class. And Mr. Jones, who was the teacher, decided to walk behind me and lecture from behind me as everybody watched me sleep. And obviously when I woke up and probably had drool for all I know, uh, she remembered she remembered that for me. I kind of knew her name in high school because I'd seen it many places. She, I mean, she, she ended up getting the uh, Cardinal Key, which uh, was an outstanding award for scholarship and participation. And I remember her from our government class. This was about 1964, Goldwater Johnson. And we had a very good government class uh, Mr. Bowles taught it, and Melinda was raised a Republican. She was a member, she was even a, 
uh, what was it, a, a TAR, Teenage Republican. There was some group at that point, but she was raised a Republican. I was not. And so in the government class, during the time of Goldwater and Johnson and everything going on, there was a lot of discussion. And usually, we were on opposite sides. And so that's what I remember from. I remember from arguing with her in government class. And she remembered me from that, too. And you know, we disagreed, but we were never disagreeable with each other. Then we both ended up at Whittier College, different ways. but. Uh, we saw each other at Whittier College, but we didn't have the same major. We weren't in a lot of classes together. But when I left on a study abroad program in Copenhagen, I started writing her because I talked to her and she was friendly. And I mean, friendship was Melinda's middle name. And so she started writing to me and we wrote back and forth. And if you read the early letters, they're signed sincerely. As I got more radicalized, over the years, I think some of them say, keep the faith. <laughs> and go, the younger people don't realize that, what that is. But anyway, I became much more radicalized. And she continued to write to me. And, and uh, we, were, we were friends. And 1968 and 69 was a very difficult time for me because I lost my graduate deferment along with everybody else. And I was facing the draft. I was not happy with the, the concept of war, much less the Vietnam War. And I had been radicalized in Europe and DC and you know, University of Wisconsin, which is kind of like the Berkeley of the Midwest in those days. And so we didn't seem to jive in many ways, but yet she still kept writing to me. When I asked her things, she could always, she'd always answer truthfully. And she was, in a way, kind of an anchor for me as I was going through this entire period of time. Now, Melinda liked to introduce us sometimes as a mixed marriage, Dodger Giants. She loved to do that in, in Scottsdale. When we go to Scottsdale for the giant spring training, she loved to introduce herself as a mixed marriage. But really, I've always thought of us as more of the odd couple. That was and the reason I picked the odd couple is that's the first date I had with her, I took her to see The Odd Couple. And it was in a drive-in theater. And I had come back for a short time from the Midwest. And she, we went out. And she went home after we went out and said, I guess my radical friend is just not my friend anymore. That's what she told her mother. And so we continued to correspond. And along about October of 68, I realized I was in love with this lady this girl. And so the letters start changing and she gets scared. You know, there's this wingnut in Wisconsin who's writing me these love letters <laughs> and I'm, you know, I'm here. So I, we continue to write, she continued to help me. She helped me with emotionally with a lot of things I was dealing with, well, what to do with my life. And she was very helpful. And then, uh, when I came back, she asked, I asked her to marry her very early in our relationship. I don't know if it was in a letter or not. Could have been on the first date for all I remember. <laughs> but anyway, I asked her to marry me and her f words were maybe. She never told me no. She would, for her dying day, she would always say, I never told him no. Well, I just put on the full court press and I kept pushing. And I kept pushing. I sent her flowers. I sent her telegrams. Uh, I sent her cards, gifts. And I didn't have a lot of money, so you know, the gifts were not too expensive. But anyway, she, she received all this. And she was kind of convinced, but she, she was raised in a household that had been struck by divorce. And she had real issues with security of marriage because her parents had divorced after about 23 years of marriage at a very impressionable age for her. And so I was fighting not only just being a wingnut out in the Midwest that liked her, but the fact that she really didn't know what she wanted in marriage. Well, 
We were the odd couple in the sense that we were different. Our height was obviously different. <laughs> uh, she never got, she always put up with the short jokes. Yeah. And she, she was raised a Republican and I wasn't. And I had become very left wing at that time. And we still got along. She had been raised in a church. I really hadn't. So we differed on religion, politics, the height, baseball teams. Uh, she was raised with cats. I was raised with dogs. Uh, it wasn't, it's like, how do these two get along? But somehow we did. And matter of fact, in terms of politics, I mean, she was her own person. I don't think we voted for the same presidential candidate until after we were married 35 years. It took, it took me that long to get her to vote for a Democrat. <laughs> but she did. And as she got older, I guess she moved a little to the left and I moved a little to the right. But again, it went back to the fact that we could disagree, but we weren't disagreeable with each other. We still loved each other. So for from October of 68 till uh, August of 69, I was with her off and on. And then I was drafted, I'd been drafted in June. She decided to come see me in Texas. And I was uh, trying to convince her. I'm not kidding. I, if I asked her once, I asked her 50 or, she used to say a zillion times, but I asked her all the time to marry me. And she always said, maybe. One day, we're walking down the street in San Antonio. I'm, I'm uh, out of pass from training. And I give her a casual, are you gonna, will you marry me? And she said, yes. Uh, stopped in my tracks. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I don't know if I can accept that because you've told me maybe so many times, is this, is this for real? And she told me yes. And then later on, she repeated it. Said, I repeated it, and she said yes. And I, in, in 2019, we have to be in San Antonio again. And we were, I always knew it was in front of a Woolworths department store, the old five and dime. And, we'll, and you come back 50 years later, what are the chances of finding a Woolworths five and dime in San Antonio, Texas? I couldn't remember what street it was even. Well, amazingly enough, we had got out and we were touring and someone told us that Woolworths and a lot of the department stores would have mosaics in the cement in front of their store. And I talked to someone who actually knew where it was. So it was just a few blocks away from the Alamo. We walked over there, there it was. That's exactly where she finally said yes. And I didn't know until that time later that during that time she told me that before she said yes, she had gone in to a church, I don't know which church, and I guess prayed about her, thought about it, so even God was on my side eventually. <laughs> yeah. But between the two of us, we, we succeeded. So that began a long romance, and with, so let's see, uh, from in on, uh, October 20, uh, August 29th, 1969, she said yes. 68, she said yes. 69? Anyway. I pursued, I'd been pursuing her for a year. And she was teaching school, living with some uh, other young school teachers. And we decided, I got drafted, and I was in the medical corps, and I got sent to Korea. And she decided, this is a 23-year-old high school teacher from the suburbs, but it was Melinda. And she decided that she was gonna come visit me in Korea. Well, you know, the war was over. It had been over 20 years, but we still had 60,000 troops there at that time. And so, on her own, she got a ticket after summer school and flew to Korea. Believe me, she was an unusual sight in those days to see in Korea. Everybody, th and we were, when we were dressed in civilian clothes, everybody thought I was an officer, which I wasn't, because only an officer would have had that possibility. And even, it was an unaccompanied tour even for them. 
So she was a rarity at that time. So what does she do, being Melinda? She comes to the Army Hospital that I worked in, volunteers, Red Cross. She spent six or eight weeks, I don't remember which, uh, what we called recreating with troops. These weren't all necessarily combat victims, but we had a sizable hospital. And she was what in the military we used to refer to as a donut dolly. They would go and pass out cakes and meet with the people who were in the hospital. So she did that. And, then, and she told me she did it because she'd said yes, she was planning the marriage, and we hadn't been together that much. You know, she said, figure, she figured out that if we, uh, if you count the number of days, I mean, it was four or five months that we were actually physically in each other's presence, and she'd said yes. So she, she flew that, I, I'll never forget, uh, she told, used to tell the story about how she was flying over uh, on an airline that went on strike. So she gets in Tokyo. There are no, her flight to Korea is canceled. So she's stuck in Tokyo trying to find a flight to Kempo Air Base in Korea. And she has all this luggage and as she's running around trying to find it, there were some GIs who were there who helped her take the luggage from one site to another. She always remembered that. Uh, it was probably an unusual site for the GIs to see anybody going to Korea voluntarily. But she, she did that and I never forgot her. When you see some of the things I put out, you'll see that she, she was there and she was with the Red Cross and she did that. Well, she came back, planned the wedding. I had the opportunity of going through this stuff to hear a tape, cassette tape, that she had sent us. And I have never heard a future bride more excited in my life. I was listening to it the other day, and Laura was in the other room, and it was just amazing. I mean, she was, she was planning the wedding, and you know, she would love to have planned this. Uh, but she was so excited, I mean, she was beside herself. I sent her a cassette back, that probably was R-rated, okay? But I didn't, Laura didn't want to listen to that one, <laughs> understandably. But anyway, so that's how we got together. We were, we were different and we were always, she was always the participant, I was always there to support her and she was always there to support me. She, uh, she and the GI Bill put me through law school and of course, Going to law school was hard. And being Melinda, what did she do? She joined the Law Partners Association, became vice president of the Law Partners. Those were people who were married to people going to law school. And so that was classic Melinda to get involved in that. So I got kind of drug into that too. Uh, in many ways, she was my secret weapon. Uh, she was so outgoing that when I would go back to reunions in Arkansas, I went to school in Arkansas for a while, and I would go back to reunions, I think they loved her more than me after a while. I mean, they were looking forward to her to come back. You know, I, I might have been excess baggage, but she, they, they liked her, especially the other women that I had gone to school with in Arkansas. She could get along with almost anybody. But when I was going through all this material, I found something I found particularly interesting that I wanted to share with you. This is just a little quote from a document, and I'll tell you what the document was after I read the quote to you. In her contacts with people from many walks of life, Melinda is effective in maintaining positive human relationships. She's capable of moving tense social situations toward desirable resolutions. Melinda is one of those rare people who is seldom burdened with personality conflicts. Her cheerful and vibrant spirit are contagious. There is little chance of gloom to prevail in her presence. That was written by a, a dean of students at Whittier College over 50 years ago, recommending her for a teaching position. And I think that aptly describes Melinda. She never changed, that's the way she, that's the way she lived her life. And that's, what, and that's one of the reasons all of you are here because that's, that's the way she was. 
but she did participate in everything. But the only thing we had in common was we spent our teen years both with single moms and no, no real siblings living at home. And we loved each other, and that was pretty much what we had in common. So we truly loved each other. Now, uh, before I went to law school, we took a trip. Uh, I taught a couple of years at St. Juliana. Even a couple of my students are here from St. Juliana's who I taught in seventh and eighth grade, so you can they're not kids anymore. <laughs> but anyway, I only taught for two years, and then I went to law school. And Melinda put me through law school. I mean, she worked, I didn't. Her, her and the GI Bill put me through law school. And in uh, consequence of that, you'll see a poem. It's in the, in the program I wrote to her afterwards. Of all the things that go wrong when you're supporting a law student who can't be bothered with mundane things because of exams and other things that are required. So she put me through law school. Anyway, we had a, a great marriage. And, and going through this stuff, I actually found a couple of autobiographies, short pages of books that she'd written. Not books, but pages or classes, high school, freshman, college. And she described her life, and she described what she was looking for in marriage. And she was looking for partnership, security, and devotion. And I think she found it. And I, I certainly found it. She loved meeting people, as you all know. It, it got to be a joke with us that uh, when we traveled a lot after I retired, we'd go to places like Russia or Eastern Europe, and Melinda would want to see if she could make a stranger smile. Just walk down the street and smile and see if they'll smile back. That was Melinda. Well, in some of those countries, they look at you like you're crazy. <laughs> That's just a cultural thing. But she kept trying. I can remember, I can remember passing one bus passing and some people, and they're looking at her, and she's smiling at them and waving at them. They, they think she's nuts. But that was Melinda. She was friendly and always open to, to discussions about anything, because we certainly, I mean, we talked about religion, we talked about politics, we talked about a lot of things. Now, she. Uh, Laura mentioned in the obituary that we traveled a lot after I retired, which was good. But we'd love to go to Ireland. And she, we went to Ireland six times in 10 years, so we were there a lot. I, I, I was wondering, I was thinking about it when I was preparing those remarks, why, why did she like Ireland so much? And part of it was the Irish people. They're very friendly, they're very outgoing, at least the stereotype is. And that's kind of what she was. And an aside that's kind of humorous was that when we were, after we had gotten engaged and I was in Korea, I made up a dummy, uh, I got access to a typewriter, and made up a dummy uh, certificate, making her an honorary Irishman by name. And I put a bunch of stereotypes in there about the Irish and you know, was bequeathing her to be an Irishman. Well, it turns out that, you know, of course, our daughter's kind of a genealogist, and we can do all kinds of things with DNA these days. We found out she was more Irish than I am. <laughs> you know, just that my ancestors came more recently and had an Irish last name. But she actually had a higher percentage of Irish, so, you know, I still have that certificate somewhere that I sent to her. But uh, one of the things about Ireland that she really liked was I know if you're familiar with the clad owl, which is a Irish symbol. And it's basically a heart being held by two arms with a crown on top. And it's supposed to stand for loyalty, love, and friendship. And that kind of was Melinda. Maybe that's why she liked Ireland that much. 
but uh, she always made me a better person than I would have been otherwise. And now, even now, we, we communicated a lot. Even now, I find myself driving in the car, even after a year, and saying something, expecting a response from her in the seat next to me. Because I, I skipped over this. Before I went to law school, we took a 72 Ford Pinto and spent eight weeks driving 12,000 miles in the United States. We went to Canada, Florida, Gulf, everywhere. And it was just the two of us and a 72 Pinto. And if you could stay together after that, <laughs> you know, we, could, we figured we could make anything, and we did. But that was quite an adventure. And you know, Melinda liked adventure. She, when she was housebound because of the pandemic, before she knew she was sick, she actually thanked me for having an adventuresome life because we'd traveled a lot. You know, she used to love road trips. We took road trips in the summer, and she loved that. And, you know, I didn't give her an adventuresome life. She just married me, and that's what we had. But she th personally thanked me for that a couple of times, which kind of shocked me. But I did appreciate it. And, you know, I always would write on cards that she made me a better person, which is true. And that came up just recently. Uh, my grandson was at a soccer practice. And it ran late. It was dark. Coaches decided they were going to a pizza parlor. People who know me know I'm not a big fan of pizza parlors. So the, he, was, he wanted to go, of course. It's his, it's his team, and he's playing with it. So I'm thinking, OK, call your mom. Maybe she won't let you go. So he calls his mom. Mom says, well, if Papa will do it. So I'm sitting there thinking, I haven't eaten. I'm tired. I don't know what I did that day, but I was tired for some reason. And I hadn't eaten, and it was late. And I really didn't want to a pizza parlor. And then I thought, what would Melinda do? Of course I went, and I felt better afterwards. She did make me a better person. And I appreciate all of you being here for her. What can I say after that? I've inserted the scripture in the middle of, of my brief homily because I want to make sure to give um, everyone enough time to talk. I just want to say in the brief time I had to get to know Melinda and in the time that I have had to get to know her friends and family, the things that stood out to me most were a deep sense of joy in life of exploring and always continuing to learn, and fierce support of those she loves. The joy piece is simple. I cannot help but think of Melinda and smile. Cultural differences, I can't, I can't understand. If you saw Melinda, I think you should smile. <laughs> remember, um, I can't help but remember something funny that she said or wonderful she did. The way she constantly asked me how my kitty is, or how Daniel, my husband, is doing. I certainly had the opportunity to meet Melinda before COVID closed everything down, but I'd only been here a month. And most of the experiences I, I had with Melinda were over Zoom. Every Sunday for worship, every week for um, the congregation's in-depth study learning about anti-racism and about once a month for session meetings. The first time we held a session meeting was after the start of stay-at-home orders, and we were just fi figuring out how to do Zoom. I wasn't sure what sort of technology everyone had at home, so I sent out both the phone-in information and the video information. And most that first time chose to use the phone. But Melinda was a little confused. She used the phone info, but expressed a laughing dismay that she thought it was going to be a video call, and she did her makeup for nothing. <laughs> uh, during this pandemic, my ability to visit in person with members was limited. 
And while I was blessed to be able to visit Melinda in the hospital last year, our congregation lost two other members during phases of the pandemic where visitors were even more restricted. And so I will never forget the buzz and excitement when the nurse greeted me outside the door of Melinda's room. I felt like a celebrity. From the reception I received, she must have been talking me up all day. <laughs> when I entered the room, she continued to tell the nurses how fabulous I am. And I think hearing yourself talked about like that, especially as a new pastor, can, can really give you a very strong sense of imposter syndrome. And I think I will probably um, spend the rest of my career trying to be the pastor that she told people I am. And yet, in the moment, I certainly could not have felt any other way than the way she wanted me to feel. To feel that I was um, exactly who she said I was. And I have no doubt that I am certainly not the only one Melinda has made feel this way. It is memory of her encouragement that has often supported me in difficult moments of this last year. And so Rich chose two scripture passages that he felt encapsulated her spirit. One was Matthew 7, 12, which is the golden rule. In everything, do to others as you would have them do to you. For this is the law and the prophets. And the other is 1 Corinthians 13. It's a very common passage, most often probably read at at weddings more than anything else, but I think, I think a memorial service makes more sense because Paul wasn't writing about romantic love. Paul was writing about the love that we are to share with one another, the love Melinda shared with everyone she encountered. So the Apostle Paul says, if I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. And I'll let Melinda's family decide whether or not she was patient. But love is kind, and she most certainly was kind. And I always like to separate kind from nice. Nice is just being polite. Kind can be firm when correction needs to happen, but it is out of love and care. Kind genuinely cares. Kind is not just trying to make the peace to get out of the situation. And Melinda was kind. And love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now, I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. And the greatest of these is love. And so with that, I want to invite the family um, 
were listed in the bulletin to share their stories of, of Melinda and love. My favorite thing about Mimi was her kindness. She always looked out for me. I met a lot of her friends. I remember a time when I got a big stuffed frog from her. When we were having, I mean, when they were having a garage sale at after preschool, and I saw it, and I wanted it. Mimi told me to ask Papa for a five-dollar bill. She got it for me. Uh, she got me things that Mom wouldn't. <laughs> when I was in pre, when I was in preschool. Mimi and Papa would take me to Carl's Jr. sometimes for lunch. I would get chicken strips and share them with Mimi. I used to always get a free cookie when we heard sirens on the freeway. She'd say, they come for you, and I always said, no, they're coming for you. It was an inside joke. Mimi used to squirt whipped cream into my mouth from the container. We both liked whipped cream a lot. She told me not to tell Mom. Sorry, Mom. I like to open the door. I like to open doors for Mimi and walk her and walk with her. Sometimes she was slow, but we both had the shortest legs in the family. She taught me to be a gentleman. One time when we were at KFC, she dropped her chicken pot pie. She was so embarrassed, so I told them that I dropped it. Then I cleaned it up. She told me I was a real gentleman. I love Mimi very much, and I miss her. I love my Nana very much. She helped me a lot with a lot of things. When I was little, I couldn't talk. She helped me take me to speech therapy and practice with me. Now I'm chatty just like her. I got my chattiness from her. She and I like to be social and make new friends. She let me do art at her house. She always had pipe cleaners when I need them. I would eat baby goldfish, crackles, with peanut butter at her house. It was special because her house was the only place that got baby goldfish. Mm -hmm. Nana was very special because she cared about others and she shared lots of stories that were very funny. She said that she had a boyfriend in kindergarten and her parents took them to the movies. <laughs> Nana and I both liked cats even though Papa's allergic. I showed Nana how to use technology and how to take a screenshot. One time I changed her Instagram name and picture. She still, she doesn't know how to change it. She didn't know how to change it back. That was kind of funny. <laughs> she used to take me to Girl Scouts and helped, she helped me sew a pillow. I still have and sleep with it. I could trust Nana and tell her things she wouldn't always tell my mom. I miss my Nana very much, and I love her. Hi, um, my name is Laura. I'm um, Melinda's daughter. Everyone loved my mom. She was kind, thoughtful, considerate, loved to laugh, and loved to love. She really was the best, and I count myself so lucky that she was mine. She gave freely of her time to those she loved, as well as to others in need. She was always there for our family. My best friend, my confidant, I always looked up to her, even though I was often stubborn enough not to always show it when I was a kid. I wanted to be just like her, but I didn't want her to teach me anything, especially how to play the piano. I wanted to do everything myself. We'll blame that personality trait on my dad's mother. <laughs> I know that at times my independent and stubborn streak drove her nuts, but she didn't force herself on me. She let me figure out things on my own while waiting patiently in the background as the safe place to fall when I needed it. 
I've always admired my parents' marriage. It was a loving, stable, respectful, and they both truly enjoyed spending time with each other. In my 43 years, I've never heard either of them speak harshly about each other, nor to each other. My dad retired 11 and a half years ago, and I know some couples struggle spending so much time together in retirement. They never did. Even while quarantining last spring and summer, they didn't get sick of each other. However, my dad was working to convince her that she needed hearing aids. He already had them, and she was convinced it was only his problem. <laughs> she heard perfectly. Dad, you were right. She needed hearing aids. <laughs> I appreciate them so much for being role models for my brother and I, as well as my children. During the 28 days that she was sick, my dad truly demonstrated the in-sickness part of the marriage vows. I have no doubt that if the situation had been re reversed, she would have done the same. I am so glad that my three children got to see what marriage is really about by witnessing my parents. Thankfully, they are all old enough to remember, and I will make sure they keep her memory alive for not me. <sighs> my mom was a wonderful mother and the best grandmother. I couldn't afford to work part-time the first year after my oldest daughter, Sarah, was born and my mother graciously agreed to babysit her five days a week. They both loved it. If I couldn't be with my baby, having my mom be there was absolutely the next best thing. It gave this postpartum mom so much confidence and relief to know that she was with my mom every day. From the time Sarah was 18 months old until my divorce, for a total of eight years, my mom babysat all three of my kids while I worked part-time. She became their best friend and confidant too. My middle daughter, Erica, used to actually ask me to go to work so she could go to Nana's house. <laughs> I had to go back to work full time when my youngest son, Andrew, was still in preschool. I had intended to stay home part time until he was in kindergarten, but that just didn't work out. Both of my parents willingly took on full time babysitting again for one more year, even when it interfered with their traveling. <laughs> Andrew had the best time with them that year and still talks about it all the time and all the things he got to do with them. My mom loved her grandkids fiercely and they loved her back in the same way. She babysat at least one of them almost every day from 2005 to 2015. As they got older, she supported them in all of their activities. Between my brother, my kids and I, she has been to hundreds of soccer, basketball, softball and baseball games, band concerts, musicals, dance, classes, recitals, scout meetings, and practices all over Whittier, La Mirada, and Brea. She rarely missed one unless she and my dad were traveling. It breaks all of our hearts that her youngest granddaughter was so young when she passed. My mom would have done anything for her, just like she did for my kids. I think the best word to describe my mom is vivacious. She was the very definition of an extrovert, like my dad was saying. My dad is not. <laughs> and neither are my brother nor I. Many times we watched her in awe and occasionally in horror. <laughs> she got so much energy from other people. When she was six, she jokingly told us she wanted to be remembered as the elderly party lady. <laughs> she adored other people. My mom loved to talk. Her parents started her in kindergarten a year early because she talked so much. There was no preschool in those days. My dad found her kindergarten report card once, which my grandmother had of course saved, and sure enough, in the comments, the teacher had mentioned that she talked too much. When I was in middle school and high school, before cell phones and call waiting, there was, this was sometimes a problem. I would be somewhere and need her to pick me up. I'd call using a payphone, of course, if I wasn't at someone's house, and keep getting a busy signal, because she was on the phone. On more than one occasion, I would call our next door neighbor's number and ask one of them to go over and knock on the door and tell her that I needed to be picked up. We always joked that my mom couldn't go anywhere without seeing someone she knew. We've sat in a restaurant before and basically dared her to look around the room and tell us who she knew and how. More times than not, she won and we lost. As an adult, I'd run into both my parents at the grocery store or Target. It was not an uncommon sight for my dad to be waiting in an aisle by himself somewhere. I'd ask him where she was and he'd say she found someone she knew and was talking. My mom was known to make bathroom friends. She'd strike up a conversation with strangers in line to use a public restroom. This used to embarrass the heck out of me, but eventually I got used to it. Now I miss it. I can picture my dad again on more than one occasion sitting on a bench somewhere waiting for her because she'd made a friend in the bathroom. My parents instilled in our family a love of travel and car trips. 
I've traveled to all 50 states and 11 of the 13 Canadian provinces and territories because of my parents. My mom had been to 50 as well, my dad 49 and my brother 48. My mom camped with her family growing up and after she married my dad, they started making road trips across the US. When I was six and my brother was four, we started taking two to three week road trips every summer crossing the US. For many, many years, our trips would always start with a drive to Sun River, Oregon, where my mom's dad and stepmother lived. We would spend a few days with them, leave our dog Bozo for them to dog sit, and then start out on our trip. Once we headed to the East Coast, we would fly out of PDX and rent a car so as to same time traveling. When we returned, we'd stay a few more days with my grandparents before re returning home. I think my parents took us to nearly every Revolutionary and Civil War battlefield. We've been to places like the Walls Drug Store in South Dakota and the French Quarter in New Orleans. We've been to almost all of the Lauren Ingalls Wilder homesteads in the Prince Edward Island in Prince Edward Island in Canada because of my love of Lauren Ingalls Wilder and Anne of Green Gables. During the summer of 2019, my brother and I, along with our families, were able to go on another road trip with my parents. We all flew to upstate New York to visit some of my dad's relatives and see where he was born and where his family came from. We had visited before when my brother and I were teenagers, but the opportunity to go again presented itself, and I wanted to show my own children. It was the last time all of us were able to travel somewhere together, and I am so thankful we did it. We have so many wonderful memories from that trip. This past June would have been my parents' 50th wedding anniversary. She wanted to rent a house in Sun River, Oregon, and have our entire family go up and spend time together. Although she wasn't with us, that's exactly what we did this summer. Her absence was immeasurable, but I know she would have been thrilled that we celebrated what she and my dad had accomplished over 50 years and in a place that means so much to our family. I have tried to emulate my mom as a mother myself. She was my go-to for parenting advice, and now she's the voice in my head. I have tried to instill in my kids her kindness and generosity with others. For many years, my mom was a professional volunteer for everything from Girl Scouts to PTA to the National Charity League to the Assistance League. Working full time and being a single mom doesn't allow me much time to get involved in things like that, but I'm trying to instill in my own children that my, what my mom instilled in me, a sense of compassion for others and willingness to help wherever I can. I can't believe that it's been almost a year since she passed. Some days it feels like it was just yesterday and other days it feels like it's been forever since I've been able to talk to her. She is never far from my thoughts. I think that she would be proud of all of us. I know that we are proud and so proud of her and so lucky to have called her mom and Mimi and Nana. As folks come forward to speak, I'm just changing the cover. Oop. There's a step there. I'm just changing the cover on the microphone between households. Um, John would have liked to have shared um, his thoughts about his beloved mom, but it was, it's going to be too difficult for him to speak. Um, but I would like to try and say a few things about Melinda. Um, as you know, she was always so warm and sweet and welcoming. I felt comfortable with her the first time I met her, all the way back in 2003. And I am fortunate to have known her. <clears throat> to have had her as my mother-in-law. Everyone in my family loved her. They still love her. They still talk about her. My parents who are here today, my aunts, uncles, cousins, my friends too. I think some of my friends might actually be watching, be actually watching the stream right now. Um, <laughs> we also both shared a love of shrimp. Every time I ordered it at a restaurant, if we were out eating, she would say, ah, a girl after my own heart. And I think that all the time, <laughs> and we'll always think that. Uh, we always had a really good relationship. It's impossible not to. Um, and when planning our wedding, I always welcomed her opinions and help. 
I remember the looks of surprise from the venue staff on the wedding day when they asked me where I wanted a planter of flowers. And honestly, I couldn't even process what they were asking. And I was like, go ask Melinda. <laughs> and they were like, what? <laughs> Your future mother-in-law? And I was like, yeah, go ask her. My mom's helping me with my dress. Like, just go ask her. It's fine. Uh, I, I trust her opinion. Um, <clears throat> Rich mentioned Ireland. I will always treasure the one time, there are their 10 times they went in six years. One of those times we met up with them uh, and we met some distant relatives of, of Rich's and we got to see where the Sullivans lived before they came to America. And she just loved, there was a story about a church bell that the Irish saved from destruction that was buried and it was in the local church and we went to see it. And she just adored that story. And um, Sean and Frank, the relatives, um, played beautiful Irish music for us. And it was just a very special experience. Um, she and our daughter Nazanin had a very sweet and special relationship as well. They would both light up every time they saw one another, whether it was in person or on FaceTime. During the lockdown, there were many times where I would just FaceTime with Melinda, with Nazanin, while John was working. And it was my turn to watch her just so she could see Nazanin and we would always end up chatting about everything and I miss our conversations. Melinda was more than my mother-in-law. She was also my friend and I miss my sweet friend, Melinda. Hi, my name is Peggy Smith, and I'm going to start crying before I start. Melinda was my best friend for over 35 years. I apologize. I haven't been able to make it through. Couldn't even write it. My daughter, I gave her bullet points, and Courtney wrote it for me. So I'm going to do my best. i first like to say that everything you guys said, you don't know what your mom said about you. I know what she said about you. And it was all wonderful. Rich, she loved you so much. It wasn't just on your side. Um, I almost wore my Dodger shirt today <laughs> to honor her, but those giants are ahead of us, so I don't even want to wear it. <laughs> I'm going to start out with something that my son Scott wrote the day that Melinda passed and left us. I'm going to try. He said, I would be remiss if I didn't mention what's been heavy on my mind all day. Well, for the last 28 days, but extra hard today. I'm sorry for your loss, all who read this. We lost one of the brightest shining stars. You may not have known her since you were a wee lad like I was. You may not even have ever met her, but your life was better because she existed out there. Top five, one of the best. I grieve for her family while counting us all lucky to have walked the same planet at the same time as she. Good night, Melinda. He was in Joshua Tree, camping with his son, my grandson Silas, and uh, he wrote that very special thing. I'd like to take some time to tell you about my friend, my best friend, Melinda and all the ways she not only made my life better, but made me such a better person. I will keep it short as it still is so hard to get through. When I first met Melinda, I felt like I'd known her forever. She had this smile, a smile that was set beneath her eyes that twinkled when she spoke, a smile that could light up any room. My friend Melinda had an uncanny ability to love. She loved unconditionally without question and without judgment. It was a love I had never experienced before in a friendship, and I can't imagine I will ever be lucky enough to experience it again. We became fast friends, 
bonding over weekly lunches at Polly's or Mimi's, sharing our salads and chatting about our kids and what they were up to recently, our sister Girl Scout troops, which is how I really remember her the first time, or a beautiful piece of jewelry that Rich had just picked out. She'd always say, oh, doesn't he have the greatest taste? And then she'd smile with a twinkle in her eye, and I, Rich gave me one today. So special. As our children grew, our friendship grew along with it. When my youngest, Haley, was born, Melinda and Laurel came to see us in the hospital because I wasn't having her. By the time they got there, I had just delivered her. So Haley was held by Melinda and Laura when she was 15 minutes old. And that was the youngest baby she had ever held. And Laura was the first baby who ever held that young. <sighs> My friend Melinda loved to travel. She and Rich would go on amazing trips together for a month at a time. And amidst all these wild adventures, she never once forgot to bring back something for my kids. And I have five of them, that's a lot. So there's a lot of gifts to remember. My friend Melinda, she loved fiercely with every ounce of her soul. I only ever saw her angry once. She was at a gas station listening to a person in front of her complain relentlessly. My normally patient friend just couldn't take it. She snapped at the person saying in an angriest voice, she could muster, you never know what somebody's going through, so you should just be nice. Afterwards, she called me proudly to let me know what had happened. At that time, we had been watching my husband slowly fade away, actually very quickly, from lung cancer. And that rude person was more than Melinda could tolerate. Sorry. While I was going through this horrible time in my life, when Melinda was the only person I confided in. She was the kind of person you could turn to at any time you needed a shoulder to lean on, even if you had to squat a little to reach her shoulder. <laughs> I had to squat a lot. Um, she would be there for you, too, to listen to your pain and to pull you out of the dark, cavernous places that loss can drag you into. I wish she was here now to pull me out of this. They used to call us Mutt and Jeff sometimes at Ocean View. Um, there have only been two people in my life who accepted me and loved me, my kids and my family, unconditionally. My father was the first, and then I had Melinda. She was the kindest person I ever met. She knew me inside out. My children loved her, I loved her, everyone loved her, and I just miss her so much, and someday I wanna grow up and be just like her. I have no more words right now. I have barely even made it this far, but I do want to share one more poem. It's Do Not Stand on My Grave and Weep by Mary Elizabeth Fry. Do not stand at my grave and weep. I am not there. I do not sleep. I'm a thousand winds that blow. I am the diamond glints on snow. I am the sunlight on ripened grain. I am the gentle autumn rain. And when you awaken in the morning's hush, I am the swift, uplifting rush of quiet birds in circled flight. I am the stars, I'm sorry. I am the soft stars that shine at night. Do not stand at my grave and cry. I am not there. I did not die. I see her all the time. I see her in all these people over here. I see her in Gwen. I see her in so many beautiful people that loved her. She's always going to be with me, and I will never stop loving her and missing her. Thank you. Our next hymn is one that Melinda would sing in choir. Uh, we didn't have a pre recording of it, so you have. Um, you are welcome to just give us time to change the cover on the microphone between each person. And for those who are watching online, I'd invite you to share in the chat anything you'd like to share with the family. We may not be able to get it up to, to share 
um, during this service, but I will make sure that if you um, share any comments uh, live on YouTube that the family will be able to see those. I know sometimes this is putting people on the spot a little bit, so I can give it a moment before we move on. Yep. All right. as well as most of you do, but everything you say about her was absolutely true. She had the most beautiful smile. She was always willing to help others. And I remember as far as our church is concerned, what I remember especially is the blanket drive. She wanted to make sure that all of us would put our money into the blankets that would go all over the world. And she was just, she was outstanding. Rich, I think you are a very fortunate person to have had her as a wife. I really envy you. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Karen Gillespie and I'm here with my daughter Trishik. And we, I'll speak for myself first. Um, I got involved with their church with Melinda um, in 1979. And when John and Laura started preschool at ages three and four, I was their teacher. And then later had, of course, Laura's children. We had Sarah and Erica and Andrew. Hi, sweetheart. And uh, Mrs. Smith, she was Mrs. Graham Cracker before she got married, but she's here as well. Um, Melinda and Rich were the, like the most awesome examples of parents, but grandparents too, with bringing their kids. Um, when Laura was working, we would see Melinda every day bringing the kids to school. And then down the road, as years went by, um, we needed a director for the preschool and Melinda, said, oh, Karen, you could do that. And I, oh, I don't think so. No, I don't want to do that. Oh, yeah, you could do that. So she always held me up. And the preschool was such an advocate for the children, for the school, the church. And um, I'm when love never dies, and we love you, we love Melinda, and we thank you, all the Sullivan family, for the gifts that we have received from you over all the years, you're always in our hearts, and we remember you with such, such love and such good smiles and good times. Thank you so much. I'm uh, Reverend Jeff Nelson, the former pastor at Whittier Presbyterian Church, and uh, Melinda served on the session while I was the pastor. And I had made a little list of the qualities of Melinda I remembered, and for me it was a sense of duty and responsibility. But everybody had spoken so far has, has talked about the same qualities, that she was a participant, Rich said, and I, yep, exactly. She was a professional volunteer. Yep. 
so we know what we did, but I got opportunities a couple of times to get a sense of why she did it. That there was a sense not only of duty and responsibility, but I remember one time, uh, she used to do the stewardship campaign, so every year we would get together and work on this thing. And I remember quoting to her a scripture from the Gospel of Luke, to whom much is given, much will be required. And she said, oh yes, that's exactly how I feel. And not that it was required or whether it was required or not, she gave it. That sense of we're all in this together, I need to do my part was something I always admired in her. And I think about her frequently when I look at what's happening in, in the world around us now. We could use a whole lot more Melinda Sullivan's. Thanks be to God that we had her when we did, where we did, and how we did. guy on Sunday mornings is a lot more efficient at this than I am. Hi, I'm Chris Rogers. I'm a member of Woodyear Presbyterian Church, and that's where I met Melinda. Um, everything that everybody has shared is right on. Melinda would meet you on your level, and um, one thing I liked about Melinda is I appreciate the very, very, very dark side of life. And, and Melinda, and I could share some real, um, real black humor once in a while. Uh, and I, I, uh, if, if you want to talk to me about it afterwards, I, I can tell you a couple stories. One thing Melinda and I both shared is um, us Presbyterians, we do like to eat. And after every uh, church service, we, we get together and have our social. Melinda and I love whipped cream. <laughs> and I, I would, you know, embarrassingly, but I would still would pile it high on my plate. But she would also uh, join me as, as the same. She would just hand me her plate, go ahead, Chris, as much as you think I need. And I, I'd let her have it. Uh, she's a lovely, lovely lady. And um, I, I, I feel her presence uh, always. I, I don't even feel like she's even gone. I, I can feel her so strongly. And I thank you for letting me share. a moment in case anyone else wants to speak, but we'll at least start preparing for the pictures. <laughs> Slide drill.
afternoon will be Amazing Grace. It's number 280 in the blue hymnal. Let us pray. Loving God, before whom all the generations rise and pass away, we thank you for all of your saints who, having lived this life in faith, now live eternally with you. Especially we thank you for today for Melinda, for the gift of her life, for all in her that was good and kind and loving, for the faith that you gave her, which inspired her loving and her serving. We pray your peace and comfort for Rich and Laura and John and their families 
and all of Melinda's extended family. May your blessing be upon them in their grieving. Be present in their remembering. Strengthen them for the days ahead. And I pray for all who knew and loved Melinda and were loved and blessed by her. May the seeds of faith, hope, and love that she planted in our lives continue to grow and flourish and produce the fruit of goodness. And now, gracious God, we thank you that for Melinda, death is past and pain is ended. And she now rests with you and is made perfect in heaven with all the saints who have gone before us and who cheer us on while, con while we continue our journey here until you call us home. Amen. And so for us. So now we leave this place of worship. And while so much of the road ahead is uncertain, the path constantly changing, we know some things that are as solid and sure as the ground beneath our feet and the sky above our heads. We know God is love. We know Christ's light endures. We know the Holy Spirit is there, found in the space between all things, closer to us than our next breath, binding us to each other until we meet Melinda again. Go in peace.